but I, 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 you know, the, the panel that comes after this one, authors and ideas, I think, is a good segue uh, from this panel because one one thing that I, I, in thinking about this, I wondered how much of, of the creator goes into the creation. Can you look at the creation and sort of uh, retcon the, the the creator from it? No. I think. I think a good work of art, you can't. A bad work of art, possibly you can. And the more that, uh, that, the, that the writer uh, lets his or her uh, you know, personal uh, uh, <coughs> polemics come into their work, the less of a, of, a, of a work of art it is, and the more of a polemic it is. And, and mm -hmm. then it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't stand up in the same way that, uh, that a work of art that's going to endure for a longer period of time and, and sort of, by virtue of that, be judged more on its own. But I don't want to hug the mic, but I just want to disagree with you. On that. I do think there are works with a specific agenda that are still works of art. I think there are some of the early feminist stories by Joanna Ross and people like that mm -hmm. that are dealing with a specific agenda, like when it changed, but are also works of art because they believe passionately in that agenda. I also think, I'm going to disagree with you, Paul, on, on, on your um, spectrum saying that bad works of art, you, can't, you can tell what the author is like, and good works, you can't. Because I think there are authors who write very personally, out of their personal psyche, and they can produce good works of art. And there are others, of which Shakespeare is the primary example. Um, scholars have said for, for at least a century that it's very difficult to deduce what Shakespeare's beliefs actually were, because he's so good at portraying a vast array of characters with different kinds of beliefs and personalities. So I think you can have good or bad art of either kind. The example that comes to mind in terms of you know, engaging with this is Woody Allen. I mean, he can put so much of his, you know, <clears throat> the neurotic, the amusing neurotic as his, as his you know, directorial persona forward that when he did something personally shocking, it put a whole different spin on his persona. So even though that wasn't even a political position or anything like that, right. I think I think I think that did a huge amount of damage to his career because it so completely changed the persona he built over so many films. Well, certainly after that point, you could go back and look at a lot of his films and see indications uh, of the behavior that he, you know, expressed in his so personal things life. Things that weren't funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of along the same lines, um, I was talking to a science fiction writer at dinner the other night ago, and we talked about James Elroy, who we both liked, or used to like. I still like him. I, I, I read his early novels and into the later ones, and it's very aggressive, hardcore stuff, crime stuff. And this other writer did too. And then she read his uh, autobiographical work, My Dark Places, which in which he talks about himself a lot, and it turns out he's done some really creepy things. <laughs> yeah. That didn't stop me. I mean, th this was a difference, though. Here, here the, his fiction mirrored his reality so closely that it, it, didn't, it didn't shock or surprise me to find out that, oh, that's what, what this guy is actually like. He was, he was writing very close to the bone. But this other writer found that after reading certain passages in this book, she just couldn't go back to him. Well. I got that whole discussion over drinks when he was dating a friend of mine many years ago, yeah, and it was like, oh, it. <laughs> and it was like, she, she, her attitude was, oh, isn't it so sweet that he's got come so far in life and recovered so well? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, he dumped her after precisely nine and a half weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to the issue of whether you can see a writer through his or her work, I tend to think that from a single work, you can't necessarily make the judgment. But when you look at a body of work, I tend to think of a body of work as like having your nose pressed too close to a pointless painting and you can't quite see it, and then you step back and all of a sudden it snaps into perspective. And to me, that's what looking at a body of work ends up being. That, you know, if you read, let's say, one Philip K. Dick novel, for example, you might not be able to posit much. But if you read a lot of them and say, Gee, I wonder if this guy was paranoid in his personal life. You know, you would be correct. And I tend to think that you, when you read a lot of works by someone, you say, well, you know, this person is interested in exploring certain morality issues. You don't know which side they might be on, 
But you know that while they're interested in exploring love, or they're interested in exploring some other aspect of human uh, you know, behavior more than some other aspect by the choices they made and what stories to write. So I think there, those kinds of conclusions can be uh, you know, drawn as well. You're clicking your tongue there. No, and I, I, you're right. Um, I, I have edited and reissued I think it's 10 volumes of Keith Lauer's writings. And they're all like 600 pages. And what I discovered, when you, when you do that with an author, you read a lot of that author in a setting. And, and, and I discovered that the things I liked about Laumer are fine at one sitting, but when you read a lot of it and you begin seeing the patterns and the repetition, I grew to the point where I, I did that reissue as a favor to Jim Bain because he owns the estate. And I, I, I really, although he's a brilliant writer, I, I just don't like Laumer because he basically despised 90% of the human race and it shows up in everything wrote. Almost all of his stories, one way or another, you don't see it when you're only reading one story at a time. He's such a dynamic writer, it just the story pulls you through it. But when you read a bunch of them and you start seeing, well, basically it's the same story over and over again. It's basically the Superman saves the world because the human race is too sluggish to be able to do it for itself. And there's the sidekick who gives up his life for the hero, and there's the girl who loves him for no discernible reason. Uh, and he usually also dies. Uh, you know, and you're right. That, and, and some authors like, now other authors will get the same thing, it's just you happen to like them. Um, you know, it's, you do get back to the point that, that I think you know, you're the one who made the comment, is that there's a lot of books out there. And, you know, I'm not going to try to read everybody who wrote, and if I run across some writer, and it might just be I don't like something about their history I know about, I just may not read them because there's other people to be read. That's a different issue from whether I'm trying to get them suppressed or not. That's, that's a completely different kind of an issue. Um, to add to what you were just saying is the editorial issue. As opposed, we're talking about readers as opposed to editors. I don't think it's obligated upon a reader to have to get over that barrier and get over being against a writer. But I think you know, an editor with a story under submission has to be able to buy something by their worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, there's well, a brilliant no. short story that you have to say it's my job to find the most brilliant thing in the world. I don't care if there's a sound no, effect. No, 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 no. I only agree with that on the proviso that the editor has to make a living and the publisher has to at least break even. Or to, you know, I mean, look, if your stuff's not going to sell. Well, I would say don't buy stuff that doesn't sell. No, right, right. right. With that caveat, yeah. Uh, no, however, I will say this. Uh, if you write something that that uh, that that your editor really annoys your editor or publisher, you better sell really really well, yeah. uh, because if sales start to slack off any, uh, you know they're not going to cut you any more than you cut them. Excuse me, just please pass the mic when somebody's talking. Parts in the back of all right, uh, one name we should have mentioned by now, but hasn't, ha haven't, is H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, isn't part, isn't his xenophobia one of the things that we enjoy about H.P. Lovecraft? I mean, his sort of anxiety about everyone and everything and how everything's, you know, we're all sliding down into the toilet and down through the many layers, regressing and, all, all, you know, that I, I think the xenophobia actually is part of what people like about H.P. Lovecraft. I, I think there's a there's an issue of temporal distance that comes into play yeah. there. That as more time goes by, it'd be what what in if it was a, a trait in a contemporary of ours, we might find really impossible to stomach, becomes kind of an interesting psychological quirk. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Paul, because I was going to want next time was my turn for the mic to add just to add to the confusion here <laughs> that yes. Distance, when you're talking about moral distance, you have to talk about chronological distance, too, because mores change. I once, several years ago, was not on a panel. I was, I was in the audience, but Jean Wolfe, who's just recently joined us, was on the panel. And some woman, whom I, fortunately for her, have forgotten the name of, made the statement that nobody should read Homer or Socrates or any of those old Greeks because they held slaves, and that was morally reprehensible. Gene went absolutely ballistic as well, he should have. <laughs> because you cannot apply the moral concerns of our age to judging those of other ages to the point where you can say, don't read them. You have to look at them through a lens. This is the context in which they live. Shakespeare's anti-Semitism was the context of London in, in his time and his place. Jane Austen's 
intense fear that somebody might sleep together when they're not married. Um, is, it looks sort of ridiculous to us now, but you have to consider her works, which are brilliant, in the context of the morals of her time. And you have to also, I think, have the humility to realize that the morals of our time are not the apex of civilization. A hundred years from now, things may look much different to some people, or many people. Um. Just to go to, to go to your point about H.P. Lovecraft, um, you know, there's a gray area here. Mike Bresnick and I recently uh, edited a volume called The Dragon Done It, and we included in there, we wrote a couple of news stories, but it's a reissue of various fantasy authors who've written, you know, mystery, detect, fantasy detective stories, basically. And we wanted to go all the way back, so there's a story that goes all the way back uh, to uh, Hodgson, way back when. And we had intended to include in a story by Jules Grandin. Uh, and then I read a bunch of them, hmm. and I called Mike up and I said, this is the worst kind of yellow, yellow peril racist crap I have read in years, and I don't want to publish it, Mike. And he said, oh, I can find something good. So I said, fine. So he read a bunch of them. He called him back and says, you know, you're right. I couldn't find anything that wouldn't feel creepy reissuing. So we just said to hell with it. Yes, he was an immensely prominent figure at one time in our field, and uh, if I was doing an academic study, I'd certainly include him, but we're not. We're reissuing a volume for which we got paid very little, as invariably happens when you're editing an anthology, and you know, and, and there's no money in this kind of thing. And why would I do that? I didn't want to reissue this guy's work. I can't stand it. And so we didn't. And you know, it's it's Lovecraft. I think is a little bit different. He's a lot more interesting guy for one thing, and it's a different kind of xenophobia. But um, you have to make a distinction between whether or not you're going to judge somebody by, by the way, just so it's clear, I don't get upset by racist attitudes that are kind of common to an era, it's just sort of shrug it off. He went quite a bit beyond that. Uh, I mean, this was pretty virulent stuff, even for his time. Um, but leaving that aside, there's a difference between whether, you know, I'm not trying to express it, but I also feel under no obligation I've got to reissue it either. I think I had a thought. <laughs> uh, I am a fan of Hemingway and, and less of Faulkner, and there's a thread of anti-Semitism in Hemingway. And talking about uh, temporal distance, I'd also add into that artistic ability. When I read The Sun Also Rises, which I've read several times, I notice the anti-Semitism more each time I read it, but it wasn't, it wasn't in my face so much the first time because I just think he's so good. If he was less good, if I was reading another novelist of that period who was more of a hack and he had the same level of anti-Semitism, I wouldn't bother with it and I'd probably be more repelled. So there might be some, some business involved with this where they, if a writer is so good, it's not that he, Hemingway is even hiding it. It's right out in the open, but you sort of give it a pass as the first time you read this book, but then it comes back at you. So I, I don't know if it's... If that means we shouldn't read Hemingway or what, he certainly shouldn't be banned, and he hasn't been. But. Um, I think we've got about 15 minutes left to go. Maybe we should open it up. If uh, anybody has questions, Eric. I want to actually turn this on, on its head. I, I was delighted to discover al al along the way that two of my favorite authors of all time were serious semiophiles, Tolkien and Nabokov. Does that, it gives me great pleasure to know that biographical fact. But it hasn't changed, the, you know, I've gone back and reread Lolita and, and Pale Fire and, and Lord of the Rings, and it hasn't changed my reading of the book whatsoever. And maybe, you know, obviously there are, there, there, I don't think there are any Jewish characters in the, in the Volkov novels. There certainly are not in the Tolkien. Um, but it's interesting to look at it the other way. What, what happens when you know, when you really, really strongly agree with the moral stance of an author? And that certainly doesn't change the way we read the work. I just thought that that's... Interesting. And maybe someone could come with a, a counterexample where they think better of a work that they were, mm, because they just discovered that they really, that this person did, you know, charity work and was just a mensch of, of the highest order. And then, then, then you go back and you read the book and you go, oh, now I like the book better. I wonder if it works that way. I think people read for two different reasons. There are people who read to have what they already believe confirmed, um, or what they would like to believe, or what they wish the world were. Um, I think romance readers fall, by and large, into this category. They want to confirm the idea that love conquers all and that eventually the one true person is out there. 
The other class of readers, and you can belong to both at different times, the other class of readers is willing to have what they believe challenged, 